In today's episode, we get to speak to Jody Holm. After a 15-year career as COO of a growing architecture firm, Jodie Holmes shifted gears and has made her name for herself over the last decade, providing on-call decision support and facilitated leadership conversations for startup founders, corporations, entrepreneurs, and executives. A lady with an inspirational, amazing story. So let's find out how she shifted her mindset in order to go and get to where she is today. Let's find out. Welcome, welcome. It's Girl Khan here, your money mindset expert. And I'm here today with Jodi Hoom, an individual who inspired me intensely. And I only recently came across her profile and realized, oh my God, I have to speak to her, I have to have her on my podcast. So welcome, Jodi. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and speaking to our audience. So Jodi, tell everybody what you do. So I do something that I refer to now as decision support for entrepreneurs. It's, it's, um, I've done coaching. I facilitate leadership team conversations. I've done consulting and something that I've half joked is like business therapy and somewhere in between all of those things is what I do now. And the, the big differentiation I make between that and coaching is, um, I think coaching is, is someone's at point A and they need to get to point B and someone's going to help escort them along the way. And I'm, I'm actually not great at that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my sweet spot, but I was doing coaching for quite a while and slowly just honed in on this really deep awareness that that most of the time people have their own answers, which is baked into a lot of kind of coaching mindset programs, but that that happens, you know, th those things don't happen every third Tuesday at three or, you know, whatever regularly scheduled thing is that people need um, on-call access, asynchronous communication to to navigate through and triage the things that are happening now. So it's it's on-call decision support, on-call sort of triaging a particular situation, talking through a thing. Sometimes that looks like really smart business part of my brain thinking through a strategy. Sometimes it's more like therapy. And a lot of times, honestly, I can't even tell you how often when I talk to somebody and they're spinning their wheels, it's just, I can tell with, it's like my version of I see dead people that they're just exhausted. And they're, they're, it's really not about the thing that they want to talk about and work through. It's, it's not about that. They're just so depleted and so run down that they couldn't decide between a hamburger and a cheeseburger. So mm -hmm. that energy management piece is kind of falls in between all of those. So that's what I do. It doesn't fit on a business card very well, but <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult to get head around, isn't it? It is. I mean, it doesn't have a handy name, but I think that's because it's, it's a space that you know, it doesn't exactly exist in the world. I think hiring a coach or a consultant or a, you know, even a therapist like that, that, there's all this weight to it. Like, oh, I have to find the right one and it's expensive. And then if I don't like them, I have to get out of it. You know, and it's, I just, I'm, I'm really striving to make it easier to just have somebody to bounce things off of. And mm. so you can keep moving forward awesome. and not wasting time. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's take a step back and say, you know, how, where did he start off? You know, where did you, how did he gain, gain to the coaching industry? How did he gain to this idea of mentoring other business owners? So yeah. what's your journey? So tell us about your story. Well, I, I will tell you the story that I have always told, but I will add one extra thing that was just recently pointed out to me that I never thought of. And then once someone said it, I was like, oh, yeah, duh, that makes perfect sense. And that is that I actually grew up in, so my mother was an entrepreneur most of my life. Both mm -hmm. of her parents were entrepreneurs, which was particularly impressive. You know, my, my grandmother owned an insurance agency in the 40s and 50s, and it was her. Wow. She had her own company, and my grandfather had his own company. And so entrepreneurial conversations are an around the dinner table, driving in the car kind of thing for me. And my mom in particular, uh, once he relied on me when I was five or six, she had other people to talk to too, but, but she would involve me in those conversations and that thinking through of, you know, what part of this is fact and what part of it's just like a story or fiction that I'm making up here that I'm adding to it. Mm. I, I literally, I, I, I can remember riding the car at like six or seven and talking through situations with her. So I guess in some ways I've actually been doing this my whole life, but it's not like I realized that and then set a course in this direction mm. at all. Um, you know, like a lot of people, my path was was quite accidental. I, I went away to college thinking I was going to be an engineer, and then I ended up switching to psychology. And so I finished with a psychology degree and was 
had intentions of going back to grad school for that, but ended up getting a job at an architecture firm where I thought I would be for like six months. And I ended up spending 17 years there. Wow. Yeah. And um, it was it was just such a unique and extraordinary experience because when I started, we had about eight people. And by the time I left, we had close to 50. And they were so happy to have somebody who they just wanted to be architects. And I'm one of those people, I like to make things better. Mm. And then I like to make it, go, you know, I, I, I once it's better, then I need to pass it on to someone else. So I just slowly... Um, at first I was doing the marketing and then I was doing the finance. Over time, basically I became the COO and I got to run that, run everything that was in architecture. But here was the really cool part. Because I was the marketing person, every single Monday I was in the leadership team meetings. Mm -hmm. And so I got to hear and informally facilitate. It was never handed to me as a job, but that's what I started doing. Um, the, those, those decisions from the beginning to the end of us growing through that. So I got to hear that vaccine story when I was like 23 years old. So it, that was that was really, really cool. So I decided to do that full time. I took some training and facilitation and in coaching. And, um, and that's how I started doing coaching on the side for a while before I left and did this full time. So that's, it's, I mean, I know that you did it for um, on part time before you went full time, you know, full blown into it. But how did you work on your mindset? How do you go from being, you know, from that kind of environment into coaching? It's, coaching is such a unique um, profession to be in because you have to, you know, you're, you're, it's based on results, getting results for your clients and making sure they do the work and whatever. So how did you work on your mindset, in your, you know, going from one to the other? Yeah, so... So it's kind of interesting. I have a, there, there's a couple things. One, one part that was really hard for me is, um, I mean, I, I grew up in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we did not have a lot of money. Um, you know, we weren't destitute, but, but there definitely was not a lot of extra to go around. That's for sure. And, mm -hmm. you know, then I came away to college and it, I really struggled with, um, a couple of versions of kind of prosperity guilt is a little bit of it sort of um, just never dreaming that you know what what used to feel like a lot suddenly I feel like well that should be enough nobody needs to make more than that and there mm -hmm. so there were some real ceilings on what I even imagined I could or would Make do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I still struggle with those. Sometimes I still find, catch myself having thoughts. I'm like, did I just have that thought? Like, I didn't think I thought that, but I literally just had that thought where I was like, did I just, did that just happen? Like, <laughs> um, and so th that was definitely in there and took some, and I'm happy to talk about some of the things that I did to kind of get over that. But it, when it comes to the part that's like doing the work, yeah. I have this little bit of, a, um, and I want to be super clear, it's not confidence. It's almost like a glitch in my brain that even when I was little, I would just do things. Like I, I remember in third grade, the teacher held up a mimeograph, if you're even old enough to know what that is. <laughs> I don't think you are. Um, it was this like be sort of pre-Xerox and it was, it had this like weird purple type and the pages came out kind of moist. It actually used water somehow. I don't know. She handed, hold, held it up and said, does anybody know how to use the mimeograph machine? And I raised my hand. And so she handed me the paper and said, I need 30 copies of this. And I walked into the teacher's lounge and I remember kind of coming to in the teacher's lounge and thinking, oh no, <laughs> like, I don't know which one, the I don't even know which machine it is, not to mention how to use it. But in that moment, I was far more terrified of the thought of going back into class mm -hmm. and being like, um, I actually don't know how to use it. And that was far more mortifying than trying to figure it out. And so I looked around and, you know, one of them had a mimeograph on it and moral of the story, like I figured it out. Mm -hmm. And because of that, and because I have routinely throughout life just been like, oh yeah, I can do that. And then I get started. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And then I figured it out and not always gracefully. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of like very mucky, not clean versions of figuring it out. But because of that, I think I just have this baked in um, trust that that like you make a decision and then you get to make more decisions after that. So like you, you start in and then you can navigate from there. So I didn't have to work as hard to um, like I just kept following the breadcrumbs of this seems to be a thing that I'm good at 
doing. And so I went to do more of it where I really got hung up a lot was on the money side of things. Like it was really hard for me to, the the sort of summary of what I'm saying is I never doubted my value. Mm -hmm. My value has always felt really solid to me. When you take value and try and translate it to dollars, I get dodgy sometimes, especially early in the beginning. Mm. Um, And that was that was a real challenge because guess what? Businesses have to make sense (laughs) from a dollar standpoint. You can't run a business if the numbers don't work out. Mm. And so that was really that was definitely some of my harder things to figure out. And how did you figure them out? So how did you overcome these? Well, I would like to say that I have overcome them, but I think what is really interesting is that that I have overcome the like the early ones, but then I think every time you up level in anything yeah. in your life, yeah. you encounter the exact same like all the old problems swoosh back in, they're just bigger versions of those mm-hmm. older problems. Yeah. If you get and, the next threshold, yes, of course. Right, right, right. So every time I up my game or get a better, you know, making a, giving a proposal for a bigger job or like or I'm thinking of something, it, it always um I always encounter it again and I feel like I'm to have to start over from scratch and I have to remind myself like, nope, this is a bigger version of that old problem. It's not like you're just stuck in that old problem. But um, I'll tell you, the, the some of the ways that I have gotten over it are actually quite, um, by, by things being foisted on me and not really realizing it. I mean, a very funny thing that happened um, was that I had a client that because of the way that they needed this thing to get um, reimbursed by another organization, they really decided where my rates were going to go because they were going to get this other, other, um, like reimbursement from an organization. Well then, so it was much, much, much higher than I normally charge. And, um, and then that person referred me to somebody else and I was like, Oh, well, I can't, I can't, give that person a much lower rate than the person who referred me (laughs) like I can't I was like so I guess that's my rate now Mm -hmm. and I gave that rate with the intention of only giving it to her and she didn't bat an eyelash and I was like oh I am undercharging (laughs) um but I I will tell you the the biggest um for me and and I it's it's an interesting because I think I think this is not just a me thing for better or for worse, and I have to just work this into how I grow my business, I am not motivated by the actual dollars. Mm -hmm. So every time I've ever set a goal of, oh, I want to get to this revenue point, I I frankly almost just like forget about it because it's just, it's not in and of itself, it's not meaningful to me. Right. Like there might be a tiny part of me who who would enjoy the bragging rights of saying like, oh, I billed this much last year. But past that, it just, it's not what yeah. makes me focus. Yeah not what gets me excited. But that's um, the case with most people. I mean, most people, I mean, who I, who I, who I talk to and who come to work with me, money on, on its, uh, of itself is not the motivating factor. It's everything else that goes in the process of achieving right. the success that goes into the sex that you have before you can achieve the money and the monetary success. That yep. is more valuable and more important compared to the actual dollar amounts in your bank account. So that's, totally. that's across, the, across the board. And there are very few people who are actually motivated by money per se um, mm-hmm. in terms of dollar amounts. Yeah. So for me, I had to, it was working for a little while that I would put it in terms of like, oh, if I do this, then my family can go on this cool vacation or something. Mm-hmm. Like I would equate it to something meaningful, but nothing really quite did what this circumstance I'm going to tell you the story of now did, which is, um, so both, so my husband and I, I was diagnosed like my senior year in college. My husband was never tested, but I guarantee you, he is also wildly dyslexic, um, with some learning Mm -hmm. issues, ADD stuff, whatever. Um, and so both my kids were just genetically like in the hopper. So so you're dyslexic. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so I'm Me not, too. No, I'm too. not technically like dyslexic isn't quite the right word, but in, you know, short of reading my 12 page report to you, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a bunch of different things like that, but they're in the zone. It's in the zone of, of right, dyslexia. Cause, cause, I'm, cause I'm severely dyslexic. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, a lot I, of entrepreneurs are actually. And, and I wasn't, I, I was assessed on my first year of law degree that I, and that I, you know, we found out, well, I, I, I actually had really d- walked idea of dyslexia until then. And yeah. when, um, when my teacher said to me, oh, this possibility that you can be dyslexic, I thought that, I found that very really offensive. I'm like, I'm smart. I'm not stupid. 
<laughs> and then yes. she, she sort of twisted my arm, literally forced me, so to speak, and got she even got my university to pay. I didn't pay for it. When I went for an assessment, and by then I had I, you know, I had really high academics, mm-hmm. I came back and I realised um, I was severely dyslexic, yep. which now I see as a gift because I call it the gift of dyslexia rather than anything else. Oh, totally. It is especially like what I've learned. My 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 kids' school that they both go to. They've mm-hmm. had they have all these neuroscientists come in, psychologists, and talk. And it really is a, a super power. Like you see things differently, and you yeah, hear you things. have to, you have an option. There's, <laughs> well, there's and and the crazy thing is the things that I am good at all tie back to coping mechanisms that I the the things that I use to help people are things that I sort of internally designed to help me understand the world and be able to like deal with it. And they are helpful to other people and so yeah I definitely think it's a gift and so what's interesting is I was mentioning the school that my kid we we knew my son from the very beginning we we could see it with my son and he's kind of an off-the-shelf classic Mm. ADD and dyslexic kind of kid and um, which as you said typically a a real marker of that is doing like extremely well in certain things and then being like way below below average in others yeah 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 yeah. so that big gap was super obvious with him and so we knew he had to go to this school and it is and it is and because for some kids um, because of that gap they would eke by in in, and it's a lot harder to get services in the public school. And we, we do actually have a school here in town that is specifically for bright kids who struggle with these language issues. And so we were already sending our son there, which was already a stretch for us financially. And then, um, and we actually moved to a place where my daughter could go to a really good public school that's got great programs. And then in kindergarten year, her teacher was like, yeah, she's, <laughs> you also ought to consider this school for your daughter. And we were just kind of paralyzed because we did not have a second tuition sitting around. Like that Mm. was just, um, and it really kind of felt like a Sophie's choice moment where we were going to have to, um, you'll be like, well, sorry, kiddo. You know, we only had resources for one of you and Mm. we picked your brother. (laughs) And, um, and so I was really pouty about that for a week or two. And then there was this day that I realized, you know, my husband has a great job, but it's not a it's not a thing where he can walk in and say like, hey, you know, I need this much of a raise. It's just, that's just not an option. And um, it occurred to me that if one of us was gonna, if one of us had the capacity to make this work, it was probably me. Yeah. So I sat down and I looked at my practice and this was so interesting to me because I built my practice from relationships. You know, I, mm-hmm. I slowly built these relationships. I, you know, demonstrated value to people, sometimes doing free work, whatever, until I got my sea legs and people, you know, really started to get some traction. And then I, it was all referral based. So I was looking at my practice and I came out with the list to my husband. And I was like, let me tell you a little story here. So here, this first person, you know, refers me business all the time, but I, he doesn't have a company that I can refer him business. So when he needed strategic planning, I did it for he and his team at a really deep discount. And my husband's like, well, that makes sense. I mean, that, that seems like a fair, I'm like, yep, it does. Number two, (laughs) and to make a very long story short, like 90% of my practice, each individual story made sense why I was giving them such a deep discount. It made sense. But at the end of the day, I was discounting almost every single client that I had. Wow. Okay, that's a yeah. mindset thing. That's definitely oh, a mindset thing. Oh, totally, totally. And the weird thing is, is I hadn't even noticed. Like it just, it because each one made sense, hmm. you know, or at least it seemed like it did to me at the time. And, uh, but, but for me, had I not had my back against the wall of the issue with my daughter, I think I would have just been like, well, that makes sense. They're relationships and I really want to honor those. I think I would have just let it slide. And so for me, the mindset often ha- is something I, I have to address it like the really big picture. It's less about the individual things. I sort of have to realize this this overarching like, wow, there's 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 a systemic issue in my model. It's not any one of these things. It's that they can't all be this way. And so from there on out, I changed, I, I really set my sights differently. And, and it helped that I had that really clear goal of like, I am going to send my daughter to this school. And because we actually committed to it. And I was like, yeah. and now I have to have this much money at the end of the day. And that, I needed that. Um, had I not had that, I don't know... I would have never told you the story that like, oh, I didn't have the courage to do this or do that. I just wouldn't have even realized that I was doing that in the first place. 
What What do you think is 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 something that you I mean, that you find common across all the clients that you work with when it comes to the mindset? Where do you think is the biggest block for entrepreneurs? Honestly, I think it is a couple things. Um, one, several of them, though, all fall under this um, a category that I feel like of having like a white knuckle grip on things. And so either they're trying to control every decision or they feel like they always have to know everything instead of having the, you know, being more sort of curious or like what what needs to happen here, like as if as if leading is about knowing and, mm. and it really isn't. I mean, by definition, lead. You know, I heard someone say the other day, like, oh, you know, I, you know, I guess as a leader, you know, I, I don't ever want to have to ask for help. And I said, hold on a second. Like you're, you're a leader, not a Olympic level individual contributor. Like by definition, leaders have to have help. That's what you're doing yeah. is you're like, you're basically a leader is an organizer of help. That's what leading is. And so I think sometimes overblowing how much it's your job to figure everything out. Um, but that other white knuckle place absolutely comes back to how they view the the, the finances in a company. I, I get really mm-hmm. um, I get really sad for uh, you know owners who are frustrated that people don't think about the company the way an owner would. Yeah. Um, they're like, well, do they even realize that blah, blah, blah? I'm like, no, they don't realize it because you don't share anything about how the finances work. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to print out your bank statement every month for them or even tell them like every little thing. But if you don't, if you don't give them line of sight to how it all works and the impact of, of just even structurally, um, classic story is people see like a billing rate somewhere and they're like, Oh my God, that's three times what you pay me. Well, there's a reason for that. Like you have like that, that there's a structural reason for that. And so when people don't have a line of sight to how the finances work in a company, then they cannot help you grow that nearly as easily as if you can sort of have that conversation with them and help them see what you're trying to do so that they can contribute and mm. make good decisions in that way. So it, it all comes back to, um, I don't know whoever said like it's lonely at the top, but I mm. think that the dumbest, most unproductive and counter useful thing that has ever been said about leadership because uh, it's, it's hugely problematic. I think, I think that's the old idea of leaders. Uh, of leaders, I think the modern, other uh, modern, and especially spiritually guided and heart-centered yeah. entrepreneurs, they tend to work with people to take everyone to the top. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one of my philosophies in my business that I, I, I don't call anybody my employee. I think they're individual consultants. And I encourage them to build their businesses, build their own brands, and and branch out. And in some <laughs> to my detriment, because I, you know, um, you know, they they go off. I, I'm sort of left in the lurch. But I, I'm pleased that they're making. They're having other other streams of income, and they're they understand money better, and they're understanding their life better. Because I don't want to be alone at the top. I want mm-hmm. to have everyone come with me. Yeah. I want to grow, and I want everyone around me to grow with me. So yep. we are all celebrating our successes um, at the top. And second thing about um, need um, help, the biggest thing that I think that I agree with you is people are re- not being able to ask for help. And it could be ask, uh, helping in terms of ha- help with the finance. It could be help with um, a task or delegating tasks. And if you don't if you don't learn the skill of asking for help with dele- delegating tasks and working with your team members, then you're a loner. And you're yeah. a solopreneur rather than entrepreneur. And I think that's there's a big yes. difference between solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. I, Very I, much. I, I think a lot of people are stuck in being in solopreneurship and don't transition to entrepreneurship. And that's where their business stags and sort of hangs out. Yeah. And to be fair, it is it is so much harder to start a thing from scratch, from, you know, to move it from solopreneur to entrepreneur than it is to grow an even small thriving business. Like there's just so much easier. So it's already kind of hard. Yeah. And then, yeah. If you can't get over the asking for help, it's even harder. The other thing that I really, really, really um, see as a huge block for moving out of solopreneur where your hours for dollars into that is not being aware of how your time connects to your money. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with some clients who who just haven't really done the the basic, well, I mean, sorry, I made this spreadsheet one time actually for my chiropractor who was frustrated because um, she was a friend of mine and I was there getting treated and 
I said, how's business going? And she was frustrated that she was like nowhere near this top line dollar revenue amount that she had picked, whatever it was. Um, I don't even remember. And I remember in my head thinking, because I knew what she charged for a, for me to pop in and have a visit. And I'm like, I don't think that math works. And I went home and, but I, but I waited cause I couldn't do the math in my head. And, um, and I sort of mapped it out for her on a spreadsheet. And I was like, you know, Karen, you would have to, you would have to see like, I think it was like 462 people a week for this to ultimately map out to that. And she's like, well, I can't see that many people a week. I was like, I know. <laughs> and therein lies the, which, which either means, I was like, but that's not a, that's not the end of the sentence. I was like, there are multiple variables here. So either you need to be okay making less or you need we to just charge, charge higher fees. Or, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to play with it here, but it is, it breaks my heart that you're feeling like it, you know, you're frustrated you can't get there when structurally this, this will never get you there. It can't get you there. And, and similarly with, I think there is a really important awareness about what part of your solopreneurship that you are so in love with. I think it can be really seductive to, um, be spending a ton of your time on the, on like building programs, writing programs and designing programs and feeling like that is growing your business and sort of shying away from the part that is actually having people pay you to the selling part. Yeah. 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 Until you have a sale, you know, it's, it's a hobby, not a business. I, I, yes. I completely agree with yes. that. I completely yes. Agree so, with so that. some awareness around like you can't spend 80% of your week writing the programs. Like you have to be, you know, that, 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 that part of it has to be working out too. But again, like I, I say all those things, but it, it's, um, th- those are just all the like funny, weird traps that we fall into when it comes to business. I think, I think the, the world of entrepreneurship and leading anything is such a fantastic personal development. Oh yeah. It's, it's <laughs> hands on personal development. It will bring sure. at, be, between that and parenting. I feel like those two things or will reliably bring up anything that you have in a back closet somewhere of your of your mindset, it will find it and drag it out into the open. Oh, oh for sure, for sure, for sure. Whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. Right, so Jody, so what would be your parting tips to our, our audience? What would be your uh, top two tips for our audience? I think it's a couple of things. Um, I, I, I think one is whenever you're aware that you're stuck on a thing, like if it feels like you can't move, you're, to me, spinning wheels always feels like a really uh, the apt metaphor for that, where you're just having the same problem over and over and over again. Whereas in entrepreneurship, progress looks like new problems. So if you're not getting new problems to work on, because there will always be new problems, um, if you're not sort of having new problems and you're stuck, that backing up to try and look at what it is. But but I will say, I just, I, I have a sort of a low trust of how often we can see our own stuff. So finding someone who can, whether it's a consultant or whether it's, you know, podcasts you listen to or a friend or someone else in business who can kind of watch you parallel park your car from a little bit back up to point out where you're hitting the curbs and whatnot. Because finding those blind spots and finding what's in your way is is going to be a consistent search. So I have, I have people that I run things by when I feel stuck and they're often like, yeah, you do this a lot. You're, um, (laughs) um, like, like I, I caught myself one time feeling, uh, really excited because somebody had sent me a message. This was very early on. It was one of the first people who like sent me a message like, oh, I heard about you and I'd like to work with you. And I was like, oh, awesome. And I like archived the message as if that was the win that like somebody reaching out to me and I caught myself I was like, what did I just do? I just archived that message. Like somewhere in the back of my head, that felt like the like, yay, I got someone's attention. I was like, no, no, <laughs> that's just the beginning. Got to get started here. So watching out for those blind spots that are in your way. And also this, this sort of steps over to the other side, but managing your energy. Yeah. Um, I, it, we haven't talked about that in this, but I will routinely come back to that because it's, if you are run down and depleted and you don't have a lot to give, your business doesn't have a chance of growing if you if you don't have the energy to put into it. And so yeah. often when I am or my clients are, we're, we're pausing or resting or taking a break just feels like the dumbest thing. You know, I couldn't possibly do that because I have all this stuff. It is often the most strategic thing you can do is 
to play hooky or take a nap or somehow renew so that you have top energy to give it because it takes your best energy. And I won't bore you with all the neuroscience, but like your brain needs that renewal time or it can't, it can't do its best work. So that's, that's the one I end up repeating probably more than any other. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your time and your energy with us and, and talking and enlightening us so much. And I think a lot of people would have a lot of food for thought and everything you mentioned. So thank you so much, Jodie. And so Jodie, where can we find you? Where, can, where, you know, where are you on the, on the, on the web? Yeah, the easiest way is um, to go to leadingclarity.com and there you can find links to my podcast if you want to listen in each week to uh, more of the things that I say and stories that we share about what it's really like running a business. I also have, um, I feel so strongly about this, like having someone to talk things through with that's not a coach. I offer just for people who listen to these interviews, there's a link there for like a 20 minute call with me. Mm -hmm. I'll be super clear. Not only is it not a sales call, but I literally will not discuss sales with you on this call. That is not the purpose. And Mm -hmm. if if that's of interest, we have to schedule a different call. (laughs) Um, I just, if someone feels like they, there's this Seth Godin quote that says, if you have a problem, you can't talk about now you have two problems. Mm -hmm. And I feel really strongly that people should not have the second problem. So if if you feel like there are things in your business that you just can't discuss with somebody else for the millions of reasons that that is so, um, there's 20 minutes of my time there for you to grab if you like, so. Oh, thank you so much. That is so generous of you, Jodie. It really, really is generous because I know how time, how precious time is. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. And for everybody listening, we will have all Jodie's links in the show notes. So um, you don't have to worry, but you can go uh, come along to the show notes and see and we'll have the, all the links there for available to you, both to her website and everything else that she passes on to us. Thank you so much, Jodie. Thank you for being an awesome, awesome guest. We've been, it's been absolutely me. wonderful. <laughs> and for those listening, thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Money Mind with Girl Khan. I will be back on Friday Future with another amazing guest talking about their inspiration journey and helping you change your mindset in order for you to become abundant. Until the next time we meet, this is Girl Khan signing off. Take care and bye for now. <laughs>